Hey, this week's topic is you're likely wrong about pro gamers. You'll learn who the guests are soon and all of the topics we'll be talking about, but I wanted to tell you why. So I tried to be a pro once upon a time, uh, 10, 12 years ago now in CSGO and before that in Battlefield. And I just think that so often, especially on LinkedIn, people talk all the time about pro players. Pro players are the center of the ecosystem. Everybody seems to think they know everything that pro players go through. And I'm really thinking that a lot of people probably don't really know. They don't necessarily talk to them. Maybe they see them on stage, but do they know how they think, act, feel? Do they know the trials and tribulations of what they go through? So I wanted to cover that. Enjoy. So you probably already know who I am if you're here, but my name's Chris, run a strategic marketing agency here in Australia called Big or Business in Games. Um, been around in esports and gaming for coming up almost on 15 years now, I think, something like 14 years. Started off as a top level player before players were really pro, I guess. Um, playing Battlefield and Counter-Strike, et cetera, in Australia, worked in PR and marketing for a long time, some play management as a journalist, did a little bit of everything until where I am today. So I'm working as the host of this, and then Jake Lucky working as a co-host as well. Jake, want to give yourself a 30-second intro? Yeah, yeah. I uh, appreciate you having me, obviously, on this. Excited to talk to these two and others in the future as well. So I'm Jake. I, I like to tweet a lot, but I was formerly with Esports Talk, as hopefully maybe a few people know of, and then after leaving esports talk, I'm currently with Full Squad Gaming, so still covering a lot of the news in the gaming slash streaming slash esports space to this day. Uh, super excited to be here. Welcome, sir. All right, Jeremy, give yourself a bit of intro, brother. Hey, sure. Um, can you hear me well, by the way? Because we cannot set up the microphone, so sometimes yep. it's yeah, activating okay. itself. Yeah, oh, good. Um, yeah, to quickly introduce myself, Jerome. Um, I've been in esports for almost of my, all my life because I used to be a pro player on CS, but on 1.6 long time ago, nothing super fancy, just did a lot of lands, ESWC and friends and so on. Uh, but then I just decided to focus on studies and work, and I've mainly been working in motorsports, including Formula One and um, 24 Hours of Le Mans and so on. Um, and then in uh, 2017, 2018, I started to work in esports um, while I was still working in motorsports. And I had some of the best players in the world, like Kenny A, Scream, and Harpex on CS because I knew them who asked for my help because they needed help on building the brand, marketing, sponsors. But I quickly saw that they needed way more than that because they had no idea where their contracts were, for example, or what they signed at the time. Um, so I told them, you need an agent, you need lawyers. They had no one, so they asked for my help. So that's how I started helping players while I was still working in Formula One. Then in 2019, I decided to focus on esports. I built Prodigy. I was living in Asia at the time. And uh, right now, I'm the founder and CEO of Prodigy Agency, which is, I think, probably the biggest players agency in the world right now. We represent players on all games, all regions, including Brazil, Turkey, South Korea. And we have uh, more than 35 employees in all countries. And um, and yeah, that's for the introduction. Sweet. Last but not least, Oliver. Awesome, mate. Um, I'm on mute, apparently. Can you guys still hear me? Yeah, <laughs> yeah we can. Yeah. Uh, beautiful. Uh, so pretty much I'm just a basic Australian male who loved playing games growing up. Um, essentially in university, hobby turned profession. Um, went professional in Counter-Strike for around four to five years. Uh, within that time, went to about 14 countries, competed in about 21 international um, tier one events, um, especially a lot of events for that would be with ESL, who I think is probably the one of the best in tournament organizers, um, then transitioned once COVID hit to a more marketing-based role within Australia. Awesome. So one of the one of the first things I wanted to talk about, maybe, maybe more of a, a question for you, um, Jeremy, just to kind of kick it off. Um, you know, I think uh, to prephrase this for us who's speaking as well as for people in the audience, there's not really, there's no pre-prepared questions. So I haven't written down anything, given it to the guests. We just want to kind of shoot the shit and there's, there's some um, topics that I love to research that I love some more information on, but starting it off heavy, heavy and hard, and I'm sure Jake can weigh in on this too. So we've seen like a lot of esports teams with a lot of layoffs recently. Um, you know, FaZe Clan's share price not doing well, a lot of other teams laying off, a lot of chief revenue officers changing around. I'm really keen to know, Jeremy, how insulated are the players from the business that happens at these esports teams? Does it affect their gameplay? Like are they, are they worried about the jobs essentially? Uh, I think it depends on the players. Like the big players right now, they are they are still in a good position because they are the face of esports, right? They're the face of the game. The teams need to invest into them or the publishers. Um, but yes, it can affect a lot of players. The tier two, tier three scene, the young players, 
Um, you can see it with Valorant, for example, with the new circuit, a lot of teams just decided to quit the game or they are paying very low salaries right now. Um, so mm. I think the players are aware that a lot of teams are struggling, right? Uh, but there is a disconnection between the top tier players that are getting paid a lot uh, and the organization losing money, that we know that. Uh, I don't think it affects all the focus on the game and so on because they are really like, they just want to win and compete. You know it is, you, you've been a player yourself. Um, so I don't think it affects them too much. And the reality, at least that's my vision, uh, is that in a worst case scenario where you don't have teams anymore, you don't have organizations, you will still need the players to play the game. The publisher will need esports, they will need events. The players will still be able to play and the brands will still want to invest into esports. So instead of investing into teams, they might invest directly into the players. That's what we do on a daily basis right now. Uh, but you can see it at a new level if one day there is no organization, which has I don't hope for, uh, but that's the reality. The players will still play. They will get sponsors. They will be able to leave. You can see it with all the streamers right now. It's it's, it's really popping off. All the former players like uh, Tariq and so on, they are doing super well. Um, that could be a model that works also. Mm. But obviously, that's, a lot of teams are struggling right now. That's that's for sure. Yeah. What about you, Jack? Anything you hear in, that, in those parts? Yeah, I feel like uh, across the space... Sorry, am I... Sorry, sometimes this thing is delayed. Um, I feel like across the space, we're, we're seeing a lot of people trying to branch out into new forms of content. Uh, I speak for myself, and I'm sure you guys can speak to other parties as well. As to, from the news side, uh, I'm sure a lot of people have seen how it's it was an esports thing, then it became a gaming thing, then it became esports gaming and streaming, and now we're covering just about everything that could possibly be warped into the so-called gaming space to my to try and make ends work. So from my end, that's what, that's what I've been seeing and actually wanted to fire back a question to, to either Ollie or Jeremy, um, you know, while, whether it was a time when you were a player or as opposed to now, are, are we seeing more players maybe wanting to make their own content and wanting to make these things work kind of bouncing off what Chris said earlier, are these players actually maybe not, you know, fearful of the organization, you know, struggling, but are they fearful for their own futures outside of the game? Yeah, hundred percent. Like, I think a lot of it comes down to as well. Um, a lot of players do want to actually make content, but you got to sacrifice some sort of competitive skill or competitive level with, um, if you want to go down that path, because if you want to be a competitive, viable team, and it does come down to the uh, value of the organization, but if you want to be a top five team in any sort of like, mainstream esport, like say Valorant, say uh, Counter-Strike, for example, your team prac in about six to eight hours a day, your individual prac on top of that's maybe one to two hours. Um, a lot of heavy focus for all these big organizations now, it's just mental and well-being, physical well-being obviously plays a positive impact on um, your in-game uh, skill level. Um, so if you add all that together, they don't really have many hours to focus on content. They don't have that cognitive load to continue to be creative um, to a content capacity. Um, so that's where the organization really needs to, in my opinion, invest in the content side of things to help these players both be competitively viable and also be able to make content. Because in my opinion, a lot of players do. It's just that depending on the individual, certain people have to put more individual hours in to be the level that they want to be to be a tier one player. So if you, in my opinion, it really comes down to the organization, the way the infrastructure is set up to insist these players in creating that content and obviously the, the creative ideas. Yeah, that's, that's got to be... Do you guys know any top examples of that, of teams who are investing well? Like I feel like one of the, the basic examples for me is like Red Bull and OG with their Dota 2 team, like making full-on documentaries about their players. Is there any other good examples? I think Optic would be a good example of a balance of competitiveness and I, I feel like their content almost carries the call of duty scene but it brings up a great point though how do you how do you somehow manage to be at the top level uh, but also be at the top of your content game it's got to be a really really difficult balance especially given the stresses of just trying to be a competitive player to begin with let alone trying to defeat the algorithms when it comes to the content side yeah, 100%. I think um, 100 Thieves, like when um, they've got, they invested in esports with their Counter Strike team, with their Valorant team. Um, I think they did a great job in their League of Legends team. Like they've always got a very content focus. Um, Sentinels, you can obviously put on the map there and talk about how I think they've sacrificed more content than they have for a competitive team. So I think there's an argument there as well. But um, I think a lot of organizations do it well. What about you, Jeremy? Jeremy? Do you have like a. Like, n not even just from a content standpoint, I guess, as a player manager, do you have a list of, like, top esports teams that you just, you know, whenever they come to you for a player, you're just saying yes straight away, ones that you really enjoy? Uh, 
I mean, if we talk about, I mean, I would talk about content first because I think uh, that's some, something that I've been deeply involved with the players. Um, some are streaming, some are not. That's something that is super important for them right now to create their own image. We can take Tens as an example in the US. When he joined us, I think he had l less than 1 million followers. And two years later, he had 10 million, approx. And he's probably one of the superstars of esports. And he has done that by winning events, but also by streaming a lot. And as you said, Jake, uh, it's really hard for his life balance because he was practicing, then he was streaming. Obviously, something else they had, they didn't have the, like with the beginning of the game on Valorant, they, they focused a lot on content. So they had a specific schedule. It's not like a CSGO team practicing eight, eight hours a day, but still they were practicing. He was streaming a lot, then he was playing individually, he was going to events. Um, that was pretty exhausting for him, but I think it paid off because he became so big that right now he can capitalize on his image. We launched his own mouse, his own merch, and he, he, did, um, he did sell a lot of products, right? Which is pretty new for esports players. Uh, but it depends on the players' personalities, what they want to do, what they don't want. Like we have players, uh, especially on CSGO, it's really hard to to have time to stream because they travel too much. Uh, so it's really rare to have CSGO players at the highest level that can stream a lot, like simply streaming maybe once, twice a month when they don't have events, for example. While you have 40k viewers, it could be massive. Uh, and then on Valorant, it's more focused on content. Um, and a lot of players succeed to build their brand. A lot of Valorant players became pretty big with the game right now. Um, so it depends on the players, it depends on a lot of things, but in my opinion, it's super important to build the brand when you are a player because you need to capitalize on it when you are at your peak. Some players decided to start after their peak and it's too late. Right? Some, some of them, they, it's really too late, especially in Europe. Um, so that's something we educate our players on. Uh, you need to do it. And if, as you said, Oliver, some players, they don't want to do it or they don't have the time or they don't have the expertise, then... That's why you have agencies nowadays. That's that's a big focus that we have. Like Zaiwu, he doesn't even have like social media on his phone. He doesn't even have Instagram. I think he has Twitter now. But still, he has a big community because we built everything for him. Like we manage Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, and so on. And so we can find sponsors for him. We can find activations. He has a good, big fan base, but he's not doing it himself because his focus is to be the best in the world, right? Um, and you can have also organizations doing it, but... As per my experience, usually the organization, they promise the players that it will help them uh, building their own brand and content, but they rarely do it. They focus on themselves because it's already a lot to do. Um, yeah, 100%. Like you said, OG, the OG piece is super great, but it's more creating the storytelling of OG than the players themselves. And so if you want to create your own storytelling, you need to do it yourself at one point or with your agency. Uh, like we have done a lot of vlog with players, for example, that are focused on the players only to build their own brand and create the connection with the community. The teams, they cannot really do that because they focus on themselves, which makes sense because they want to find sponsors. They want to develop revenue streams. As we said, they struggle already. So they need to capitalize on using their assets, which are the players, the first asset to find their own sponsorship. And if you want to develop your own brand as a player, you need to do it yourself at one point. You need to stream produce content, doing vlogs, um, creating your own merch when you are big and so on. And that you need to do it on your side and with your own stuff. The teams, they will not do that for you usually. You know, I think um, for those listening too, Jeremy just touched really lightly on TENS did a successful mouse launch, but I just wanted to highlight how successful that actually was. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't give it much light of day. So for those that people was. listening... Tens, as a pro player, sold 40,000 units of mice in a few hours at 189.99 per mouse, making just under $7.6 million worth of revenue. So, I mean, if there's a good use case for ways to generate content and what you can do with it, that's that's a use case right there. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that's something that we were maybe lacking for the players. It's a proof that the players can sell. Obviously, it's with Final Mouse, it's a big marketing brand, but I'm pretty sure Tens could, could launch a mouse with anyone. If it's good quality, it will do the same. And I think a good reference is his merch also. Like, he's, <laughs> it did sell a lot of merch while we launched his own merch. Obviously, we had a good campaign with Warren James where we did a full um, anime manga around Tens and, and so hype and so on, but he did sell a lot of merch, probably more than a lot of uh, athletes, for example. And it's a proof that players can actually sell uh, because he became more than a player right now. He's an icon. He's a, like a lot of people don't even play the game and they, they are fan of dance right now. And, and he succeeded to do that by doing more than just playing the game. Was that, was the mouse drop his idea? 
or did it did it come from the company side? Did it come from your side, from the management? Yeah, how did that start? Um, that was a conversation between the CEO of Final Moss and myself. Right, that's something that we discussed because we've known each other for a long time now. Been discussing a lot, and um, I think it was just making sense because stands at the time. And I hope it would be the best in the world again this year. But at the time, he was the best in the world on Valorant. He was crushing it. And he has always been uh, a massive geek and fan of all peripherals. Like he's, he was always changing mouse, testing everything, doing reviews and testing mousepad. And, and he's a huge fan of technology, um, especially for peripherals. So it was just making sense to make a mouse that he likes, making a product that works. And, and, and even in terms of revenues, like... Like, I think the biggest drop that Final Mouse did before the 10s one was 20,000 miles, and it was already a big, a big stretch for them. And when we discussed, I said, yeah, if we do it, we do, we do 40,000. And they said, are you sure? I said, it will sell. Like, you, you will sell out in a few hours with 10s and Final Mouse. Um, I, I mean, I'm happy that it was a success, a success in a few hours, but, uh, I think it's mainly combining the, the strength of Final Mouse because they have a huge marketing of luxury brand and uh, the image of Tens. For me, it was sure it was a it was going to be a hit. And the reference I had um, to explain why I contacted the brand is is basically like Michael Jordan in with with Nike in, in NBA. Right, that's my dream. That's always been my dream as an agent. I want to be able to create brands for the players uh, that can be. Like you can talk about it in a few years and so on. Ideally, it's uh, even creating their own brand in the future. But that's really, that was the reference I had. Like Michael Jordan, it's Nike. That's what I want to do with Stans. And that's what we started with Final Mouse. It was just one drop, but that's what we, we are working on building right now. Jeremy, Jeremy, I promise I won't clip you right now. How long till we see a Tens keyboard? <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> not, not so long, I think. Like, That's awesome. I mean, he's, he's a big fan of keyboard also. He's always trying keyboards and, and uh, I don't know. I cannot he say. But, like but twice that's, a day. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, like uh, my goal and I think his goal is to have his own brand, like the food brand, having the tense brand with everything. That's just, just so it is and having the best quality possible. And, and, um, and that's something that I really want to do also. I think really quickly, Chris, if you don't mind me asking as well, something to bounce back on is obviously Jeremy brings to light some some really good opportunities for people like Zaiwu and Tens, and those are the top notch uh, of guys out there, right? Um, succeeding this space, and they have brands that they've built from the ground up, but they have certainly exploded. And then the content and everything else follows. Uh, how how would you recommend though everyone who's in the grinder right now? You know, Tens and Zaiwu are the top notch. There are thousands upon thousands of players who are trying to compete and make content well below that. And in a market where we're currently at right now, where YouTube is very difficult and all these other social media platforms are so competitive. Do you have advice to someone who's trying to compete? This goes for both of you and also make content. Like, is there advice you can give someone right now? Um, I can start by saying that the like Tens and Zaibu and the big one, they started from scratch also, right? They started from zero. Like Saiwu, when he started to be a pro player, I mean, it, it's already 2019, but he was seen as very promising, but he had like 2K followers when he joined us and he joined Vitality, right? It, it started from zero. Um, the main thing as a pro player, obviously, and I'm only talking about pro players because we, we don't do influencers. We only do pro players and that's the topic tonight, is that... To explode like that, to be famous and so on, to, to develop your brand, th there is no secret. There are two things that are monetary, um, or at least um, for me that are monetary, is the first one is to perform. Like if you become the best player in the world or one of the best players in the world on your game, you have all the opportunities to create your brand. Um, yep. If you struggle, if you are a tier three players, you are young, you, you don't perform and so on, it's really hard to, to showcase yourself. And the second one is to make content, but I would say it's mainly streaming. Uh, you, we can talk about YouTube, like Tens was doing 600K view per day on the video, one video per day. It, it's really boomed off with Valorant. Right now it's going okay. It's going still great, right? But the main thing is streaming. That's the main thing. If you want to create your brand as a player, or even as, a, as, as an influencer, right? But as a player, especially you need to stream. That's where the people are. That's what the brands are looking for right now. That's how you build connection with your, with your fans. 
Um, you win, like, let's say you're a player, you win an event, then you stream the day after or when you're back home and you celebrate the win with your fans. It's just simple. That's what Simple is doing. When he's winning an event, he launch one stream, 50k viewers, 60k viewers for three hours, and then he don't stream for one month, but people are super happy and it helps building the brand. But it's really hard to become a player that people are fans of or are following if you don't win. That's the reality of it, right? You need to start winning. It's like a football player. Like if you're, I don't know, a League Two player in France, you're not really uh, famous. If you become one of the best, you can build that. And it's uh, putting the efforts to build your brand. And for me, it's mainly streaming, right? Now you can ask me, like, is it important to have 300K on Twitter? Probably not. Like if you have 5K viewers on Twitch, it's it's way 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 easier to build your brand and find sponsorship than having 300k on Twitter. People don't really care right now. Twitter, even Instagram, to be honest. Hey hey, are, are you digging at me right now, Jerry? Calm down. Dude. <laughs> it's mainly <laughs> streaming, streaming, streaming for the players at least. It's just, uh, that's even the the organizations. Like obviously, it's important if you have one million follower, it it helps negotiating the contracts. But when you have a player that is streaming every day. And he's still one of the best and he has 5k, 10k viewers. That's massive to negotiate. That's the main value that you have on top of being the best, right? Yeah, it's so engaged. Yeah. How hard is My it point. for those smaller players to like break through into that, into that upper echelon, either as a content creator or a player? Do you find there's like an almost impossible ce- ceiling for them to get through? Dick Stace is probably a good one to chat about this too, I think. Um, so for that, yeah, obviously, as Jerome said, it's um, definitely performance related. Uh, I think a lot of the time there are other factors that come into play, potentially like for our situation, for example, coming from Australia, um, we definitely have the support of the Australian scene, which obviously isn't as big compared to obviously your America and your, your Europe, um, say South America, for example, um, all the SK guys previously, like before they had their incredible major run. In my opinion, they were still like had the support of Brazil. Like like that audience is still huge. The the amount of population support they have um, for their stream, for their Twitter uh, is incredible. So there is that factor that comes into play, like, like where you are from, um, if you're the only team in that competition from that region. Um, another thing for content, it is hard. Like, to, like with Zyo and Tens, in my opinion, they're the star roles. So when you play a game like Counter-Strike or a game like Valorant, um, I think League of Legends is quite even. But there's, there's certain roles that aren't as flashy and don't really attract the eyes. So I think it is quite... Like, if, if you are a player up and coming, I'm not going to say just, just play the star roles because those supporting roles are so integral and they are so important to winning. It just depends where your values lie. Like... Um, especially if you're an entertaining personality, you can become a quite a huge streamer, but a lot of people that do play these competitive games and are just focused on winning to have that competitive drive, they just care about winning. Like they, they don't care about the content side. Um, what, when Jerome's points come into play would be once you're performing well, um, diversing out into that content field, once you actually have achieved that, com- um, that competitive position that you want to, uh, that thing is a huge point. I agree on that. Like if you can, you can think, um, that some players could do the the opposite. Like you, you are not yet the best and so on, but you focus on content. But then the only yep. way that you can succeed is to have something specific. You, have to, you need to have a specific personality. You, be, you need to be really fun. You need to have something special to attract viewers. But when you try to be a pro player, you don't really have the time to do that every day. You focus on playing, practicing, watching demos, talking with your coach, with your team. You cannot stream six hours a day uh, for, I don't know, six months until you pop off because people start to noticing you. You cannot really, yep. because if you do that, you sacrifice uh, learning on the game. When you're a young player, you need to learn from the more experienced players. You need to learn, you need to go to lands, you need to become a, best, a, a better player to have the opportunity to join a better team. That, that's how it works. You start with friends, then you join a team, then you want to join a better team and a better team until getting noticed by uh, an organization, an agency that will help you sign with a, with a better team. And if you focus on streaming, you can miss a lot of those professional opportunities. So it's really hard to like become a pro player and a big content creator at the same time. Usually it's probably becoming a pro player then starting to stream and capitalizing on your image and and the winnings and becoming a big content creator. And then at the end of the career, you just focus on streaming, right? Uh, The opposite is usually it's not working that well because it's really complicated. 
Yep. And I think what helped Tens like uh, a lot as well is like in Counter-Strike, he was, in my opinion, like um, a tier two player who was an aim star. Like he's a, he had incredible potential. Uh, when Valorant came out, which is a new game, which is a 5v5 similar to Counter-Strike, it's kind of like a rare situation, but he transitioned to that and like naturally just because of the fundamentals of Valorant compared to Counter-Strike was the best player in the world just by de- almost by default purely because of his understanding with Counter-Strike and transitioning to that. That's why a lot of Counter-Strike players did transition to Valorant and become the biggest names at the moment. So say you're Dapper, for example, you're Shazam. Um, I think that was a, a huge point as well, just like being fortunate enough to be in that position to transition to a game that's similar to the one you played previously. Um, and it really paid dividends because they just drove content home in that and joined uh, teams together um, and became number one. You know what you're talking about before, Jeremy? It takes me back to like, you know, I quote unquote retired, I guess, from CS like eight years ago, right? And I was trying to be a pro. And I just remember <laughs> any time I spent not playing the game, I just felt so guilty because I wasn't even the best player in Australia. I wasn't even the best player in my team. So like I'd be out with friends, you know, having dinner or something, just thinking like I should be home pracking right now. I've got to beat Sponge and Foxy. You know what I mean? And, that, and I, I wonder if that also plays into the players as well. Like, why am I streaming for six hours to do this $10,000 sponsorship I don't really care about when I just want to win a major? Yeah, no, for sure. And you also have the pressure of the organization. You have the pressure of your teammates, of the coach, and more importantly, of the fans, like the public. Like, let's say if you are not even the best player in the world, but if you stream, then if you win, that's that's good. If you, if you don't win, if you lose, if you have better... But one bad performance, then everyone will say, yeah, he prefers to stream than being a pro. And then you start to having this bad reputation. Yeah, it's what happened on Valorant for a lot of players because they were focusing on content more than practicing. But I think it was also a good move, like for Tens, for example. It was it was something that was a good move. But then you can have this image of, yeah, but he prefer streaming than practicing. He's not really a pro player. He's, he's a streamer and a pro player. Um, and that's a lot of pressure for players. A lot of players would like to stream, but this, but they are they are also scared about what the public will think, what their teammates will think. Like like you have Definitely. your teammate is is the biggest grinder. He's he's playing retakes on CS. He's playing retakes, face it every day. He's doing FPL. He's practicing. He's doing demo reviews. You as a player, you say, yeah, that's great, but I would like to stream and having some fun. But then you think, yeah, but this guy, what will he think about that? Will he want to kick me in six months because he thinks I didn't grind enough to win with him? Um, but so, yeah, you have a lot of pressure as a pro player um, from everyone and yourself, obviously. Yeah. Hey, uh, I'm going to just try to reconnect to see if I can jump my PC. But as I go, Jake, I wanted to ask, you retweeted something about that recently, right? Some player came out talking about Shroud coming back from streaming to join their team. Um, I, I the only thing I remember recently was actually there was comments made about Shroud. He was actually talking about Simple, and uh, I, I believe my memory might be escaping me a little bit. But Shroud had said that a lot of it came down to passion, not necessarily skill level. Uh, there was there was a base skill level that a lot of pro players do have, but passion and to actually just stick it out with the game, especially as you get older and older, was a huge huge driver. Uh, for why simple someone like him is so successful because he has that base skill. He's obviously nuts of the game. So too, some might say shroud was, but shroud said a defining factor was, was passion in these players. How, how would you guys feel about that? A hundred percent. No, I think simple has something like 20,000 to 25,000 counter-strike. He lived and breathed it for years and years. Um, so obviously he's got to have undying passion to, to be able to put that amount of hours into a game. No, so I saw those tweets and a lot of people's arguing about the fact that Shroud is maybe um, insinuating that he could have had the same skill level as Simple if he was uh, as passionate. I, I don't think he, me- he meant that, but a lot of people started <laughs> to argue that was the case. Uh, but yeah, obviously, you need to, like the pro players, especially on CS, right? Um, they are sacrificing a lot to be pro players. Like they travel 200, 250 days per year right now. They, 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 they are barely home. They don't have vacations or they have two player breaks, but usually they start book comping during the player breaks anyway. Um, so you sacrifice a lot and you need to love what you do. If you don't, you, you just become crazy. You have seen, a, we have seen a lot of burnouts and it's, it's a lot of players who are really close to burning out and they are still. That's the reality, especially on, on CSGO because you travel too much. Um, but yeah, you need to be passionate, but like, to be honest, if you talk about simple, I just think is 
is something special. It's like the best player in the world right now is Zaiwu. Okay, I'm I'm biased. This year was the best, but they just have something special. Like Zaiwu, like they could they could not play the game for one month. They would still be the best in the world probably. They, they, those kind of players, they are very special. Um, but obviously, you need to sacrifice a lot, and you need to live and breathe, as you said, uh, Oliver. You need to breathe the game. If you don't, then you you cannot grind anymore. You cannot keep walking. You cannot yep, anti strat the opponent, and then you will not be as good. Um, so yeah. How's I my? Uh, so I was going to say, how's my volume level, guys? I've just rejoined my PC. Um, Sound good? It's okay. It's okay. Sweet. All right, go for it, Jack. Sorry. Yeah, I just wanted to bounce off that too. Um, you know, Counter Strike is the go to example when it comes to God dang, what, what kind of travel schedule is that? Other esports are, are up there, but I don't know if many compare to that of, of CS. But I, I guess in general, my question for you both would be whether it's a player you know of or speaking from personal experience, what those sacrifices actually look like. You know, um, on a daily basis, what, what time is dedicated to an esport when you're trying to compete? And then, like you said, travel wise, or, you know, what do you miss out on throughout a year as you're trying to be a pro? I think people would be enlightened to hear that kind of side of things. Um, I think for us, it's, you can start maybe yeah. Yeah, as a player yourself. As a player, like coming from an Australian organization, an Australian team, um, a lot of travel time, all of our all tournaments were over in towards the Europe area. A lot of the time we were going to Pau Pol and Catalyst, which is a roughly about a 35 hour flight um, to combat jet lag for these tournaments to have our best chance possible. We would be traveling about a week or two weeks prior. So then you'd have to stay and depending on the length of the tournament, potentially you might be in Poland for a month. Um, there was a time for the major because of the disparity and the difference in time um, between the, the Asian market compared to um, the major, it was about a month. So we stayed in Poland for about four months, just for this example of this one tournament. Um, so within that four month span, you're obviously sacrificing so much of your development back home, so much events family wise. So if you want to talk about it from a personal perspective, yeah, there's a lot of um, important um, life events that you're missing back home, but you're sacrificing that to be the best. Like, like we wanted to, we, we have a mutual goal. We talk about it as a team um, and the, best thing about it is that you do have these um your, your teammates which are your best friends um and in my opinion it's it's definitely worth it for the experience and for the opportunity to try to become the best at your game because everyone that plays competitive at that level in, in my opinion has such a big competitive drive you need to fulfill it and it, it was probably one of the best experiences of my life being a pro player yeah i think that's a good recap, um, especially like it's, it's, it's even harder when you come from um, Australia you know, because you have to travel to Europe and so on. Most of the events are in Europe. You have a few events in NA um, on CS. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's, that's what I said also before. Like you practice every day. You have to go to boot camp. You have a lot of pressure from um, the team, the organization. Um, you are getting paid a lot. Like we always see like people, yeah, he's overpaid and so on when he underperforms. So you have massive pressure. So you always want to grind. Uh, you always want to be the best and perform. And when you travel on top of that, like the chair one CS, they travel too much, like way too much in my opinion. That's something that I really try to fight for the, the schedule and so on. Um, then you barely have a, a life to be honest for those players. But at the same time, they, they are very exhausted, but they also enjoy this life because you have the adrenaline of playing on stage all the time and practicing 100%. and being the best in the world. So, so you like it, but you know that you are exhausted. So you would like to have a better schedule, but when you don't have an event for a few months, then you say, when is the next event, right? When, when do I travel? But I think it's something that you can do only for a few years. Yeah, you, you cannot do that for, I don't know, 20 years. And that's also why like eSport players' career is, is sometimes really short and some players, they don't succeed to have a long career because it's very, very, very exhausting and you don't see your family too much. You don't see your girlfriend. It's really hard to have a family life. Um, and it's, it's the case on other games also, but it's, it's, it's better. For example, if we take the biggest esport, uh, in my opinion, which is League of Legends, um, they play the franchise league in the city, like in Berlin or Los Angeles in the U S and they live there. So you can have a family life. You go to the studio for one, one or two matches and for Valorant also will be the case, uh, in the studio, you live there, you play the land there and you just, you just have to travel if you have the MSI or the walls and so on, which is way more sustainable than CS. 
Um, so you can have a, you can have a normal life as a League of Legends pro player or Valorant pro player right now, which is way better in my opinion. But at the same time, when you are a player, you are young, you you travel to all the countries in the world. It's also exciting, like Oliver said. Um, I'm going myself to all the countries, all the events, and I used to do it in, in motorsport also. And I always, even if it's exhausting, I always enjoy. Like uh, we went to IEM Beijing in China and I was with uh, some of our players. We went to the Great Wall of China. That was the first time in my life that was super exciting, right? <laughs> and then you, 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 you forget a little bit about, yeah, I had a long travel. It was exhausting. Beijing is not the best city. You, you had a great experience. Um, so that, that's, that's how it is right now in, um, in esports. To put it in perspective as well for the listeners for 2019 for Counter-Strike, for example, which is different different to other esport titles, um, there was a tournament essentially every weekend almost for, for nine months and sometimes even two weekends on the, um, two events on the weekend for nine months every weekend in different locations. It was, it was ridiculous. Yeah, I remember like which, which team was it in the US that played, was it Liquid? I don't know. Uh, they played the final mm. in the US and then they were playing 24 hours after in Europe. So they, they won the final, I think. And then they took a plane. They went to Europe and they had to play. Like they were Jeez, full jet lagged against they my stay. team. Their, their first match was yeah? against my team. Ask. We ended up beating them. They were very jet lagged and very like uh, was, it? was it liquid or? And we were cheering. It was liquid, yep. Uh, it, is, it's, <laughs> it is crazy. You play one of the biggest events in the world in the US. Then you travel 24 hours after you play the first match in Europe. I think th- yep. that doesn't make sense, right? That's why uh, CSPPA, I mean, good and bad, but CSPPA and so on, and a lot of people started to fight for having a better um, agenda, calendar for CSGO. It's still far from perfect, but at least we avoid these kind of situations right now, normally. But yeah. yeah. I think it was evil geniuses, to be honest. Maybe, yeah, maybe. Hey, Jake, what about some tips from you? We were talking, like, back to that topic we were talking about before about how people can grow on social media. I mean, you've gone from you know, zero to a hundred real quick across social media, putting in a lot of that grind, a lot of effort. Like what do you suggest some of these players do? Hey man, I just got a Twitter following. No one cares about that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, it, it's definitely been difficult. And I honestly, in, in my opinion, I think it's only getting more difficult. I think there's a lot of crossover between the competitive space of pro players and esports, just as there is with content streaming and everything in gaming right now. Uh, you know, I think kids are getting better and better and more cracked at video games on the pro side and content creators getting more creative and dedicated on the streaming slash content side. So I've, I found it very difficult to adjust. I think the last three to four years were a bit of a, of a, of a golden age when I was coming up with esports talk, it was a lot easier to grow. And now there are so many competitors on YouTube and all of these algorithms are changing across all social platforms. And I would say ironically, so just like with a video game, you never know when it's time might come. You never know who's going to buy Twitter and you never know what's going to change on these social media sites. Twitter's going through a bit of a, of a downturn right now. So I've actually found it very difficult. And uh, yeah, the only security blanket that I ever had was having at least two social media platforms, which that you felt you had a presence on would be my biggest recommendation. And uh, I think a lot of people might choose their big three to hang on to and YouTube is a big staple. For a long time, Twitter was a big staple. Twitch or a streaming platform, a big staple. So my advice would be just like these two have said as well, is to spread yourself out and you know gather an audience on any platform you can, but you got to be so consistent nowadays. So I'm not even sure my advice would be the best. It is a, it's a freaking grind in this gaming space right now. I mean, the main thing that everyone talks about, which you said, Jake, is just consistency. I mean, everybody says it, but nobody does it, right? Yeah, I mean, it's also another discussion of, you know, you can grind on a lot of platforms, but a lot of these platforms don't have proper monetization set up. So it's really not not just consistency, but it's who can survive in the long run and outlast those who fall off the platform or stop using it because they can't afford to. Uh, You know, Twitter had monetization for a little bit. And it's kind of going through its changes. Uh, I know we see YouTube short form, TikTok short form, trying to go into monetization because that's the easiest way to get views right now. And long form content is really struggling. And like uh, Jeremy said earlier, you know, the, the power right now is in concurrent viewership, live stream. If you can pull a concurrent viewership, you are in safe hands right now, I would say, as compared to anywhere else. Can I ask, uh, can I ask you another question, um, Jeremy? 
um, people ask me this all the time. Can you just give a bit of a highlight as to player salaries between different games? Like how much can an entry level kind of tier one player expect to make and, and some figures around, you know, what the top in the, what the top in the game make? Um, yeah, for sure. Um, I can start by uh, CSGO because, I mean, we have Oliver there and uh, I'm a hardcore fan. Uh, but on, on CSGO, I mean, on all the games, it's a bit the same. Like the tier one, top tier players, they have great salaries. That's the salaries that everyone is talking about. But then as soon as you go into tier two and young players, it's not the same at all. Uh, except maybe League of Legends Academy, they have decent salary, but on CSGO, even Valorant right now, that's a struggle for a lot of players. If you're not in the top 30, maybe top 50, it's really complicated. But the highest salaries, like on CSGO, you can you can have players with 30k, 40k per month and bonuses, and, and they have also cash price, they have the sticker money, so they can earn a few millions per year, like the very best players. Um, on League of Legends, that's where you have the highest salaries. You can, you have players that are getting 1 million, 2 million, maybe max 3 million per year as salaries. And then they also have cash price, which is not that important on League of Legends. That's not the focus compared to other games, or at least yes. Um, and then they have some revenues, but they, they have pretty big salaries, especially in the US, in NA, as usual. Um, and then Valorant is starting to blow off also with the Franchise League. You have players getting 30, 40k per month. That's kind of the biggest salaries right now in the US. Then in Europe, you have a few players around the 20K mark. Uh, but that's only the beginning of the game. That's the first year of the franchise, so it might uh, keep growing, especially for the players that stream again. like For example, if I take Europe on Valorant, you have a huge gap between the highest paid players because they are the best, but they also stream. They have a big image. And some players playing in the same teams or maybe as good as them almost that don't have a following and, and stream. A massive difference. Like you can go from 20K to 6K for players playing at the same level, right? In the same team. That's that's what happened in a lot of games right now. Um, and then, I don't know, we can talk Rocket League. I don't know if you follow Rocket League. I'm a big fan of the game. We represent yeah. some of the best players. Uh, the game is growing. The game is really, really growing with the view for base and so on. Um, right now, the players are starting to to earn more than 10k per month, also, and they are 15 years old, most of them, like 16 max. Okay, we have a player that is 22, uh, 23 right now is the oldest player you can imagine in Rocket League, um, and they 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 earn like 10k. And as an entry player, I mean, you start at one, two, three k, and then suddenly you get 10k per month because you join one of the best team. Um, so yeah, we. we the best players have high salaries, that's for sure, because that's where the value is. They are the best in the world. All the teams want them, so you need to pay the price and it's growing. Is it sustainable for the teams? I don't know. That's the teams who um, answer this question. I'm here to negotiate the best deal for my players. Um, but then under this level, then you have a small level where you can earn your life. You can you can live, right? You can live okay. And under that, it's really a struggle. A lot of players are grinding, are good at the game, never have the opportunity to, for some reason, because of networking, because I don't know, they are missing something. They never have the opportunity to go into tier one or tier two, high tier two. And they, they will earn like 1K, 2K per month. You don't live with that. You don't build a future with that. And that's really hard for a lot of players. Like 99.99% of the players, they are um, not earning any money playing right now. You only have a very few players that earn their life pretty great. Like if you take League of Legends, you, you I mean, you don't have that many teams in the franchise, right? Uh, Valorant, that's even worse right now. You only have uh, four teams from NA in the franchise, then you have Brazil and so on. It's a very few players compared to all the players that would like to be there. And the other major question I get asked all the time too is what's the split of prize money? So how much do the players share with their managers and how much do they share with their teams? Um, it depends on the games, it depends on the teams, but usually what is standard is basically doing 50-50. Some teams, they have 70% for the players. Some teams, they, they try to push for 70% for the teams. Um, it, it depends, but a, a fair split, if we can say, if they have normal salaries and so on, could be 50-50 on the cash price. Um, maybe a little bit more. Obviously, I always push for more for my players. And it's the same for the stickers money. Like the stickers money, the I don't know if people know what is stickers money, but it's basically in-game items 
that um, are sold by the publishers with the name of the players or the logos of the teams that people can buy and then it generates a lot of revenue, especially on, uh, on CSGO. Um, and then usually it's the same, like the teams and the players, they are 50% for the players, 50% for the team on the team stickers, for example. And then on the player's signature stickers, I always negotiate 100% for the player or worst case 90% because that's their own image. Uh, but that's usually the split. And depending on the teams, depending on the game, you can have, like Rocket League, you, you still have a lot of teams where the players take 100%. The, the organization don't take anything. And then when the best players are in an organization that is taking zero, when another organization wants to sign them, then they need to align on that, even if they are not used to, because that's a massive difference. Hey, off that, Oli, I wanted to ask, like, with the like Australian underdog mentality, how do you feel like when you're going to an event and you know that you're going to play against Team Liquid and these guys have like a dietitian, they have a maid at their house, like they're on like 20, 30K a month and you're coming from like little old Australia. Like how does that make you feel when you go to compete against them? Mate, the amount of tournaments I rocked up in Europe and then because I've got jet lag and wake up at like 5 or 6 a.m. on game day just purely because your, your body clock is, is naturally like that. And then you see Team Vitality, you see North, you see Astralis. They've got PTs in the gym. I'm, I've gone to the gym just to go a little sweat on and they're just doing team exercises together. You're just like, this is a whole different ball game. They've got their PT doing it with them. Like they've got all their mobility exercises that they're doing. Um, they do even do yoga as a team sometimes, uh, breathing exercises. And I was like, yeah, it's a different ball game, but um, um, it doesn't really intimidate us. It's um, coming, having being the underdog here. Don't really have much pressure, uh, in my opinion. Um, the expectations are already set from from other people on you. So the only pressure you really put on is is from yourself. Um, and you're there to win. You know it's your only opportunity. So, um, in my opinion, we, our team thrived on that, and we love being the underdog. That's why we upset so many teams, and it really did help our brand in that in that regard. Like we because of. Our position, um, uh, our I guess, social media, our kind of brand image was more to be Mimi and just kind of take the piss, like in, in Australian terms. Um, and essentially, any sort of upset would just kind of milk that and try try um, amplify a brand from that. Uh, so that was kind of like our business model, and I think it did really well. And kind of COVID kind of uh, pulled that out from under us. How do you um, how do you make the decision to retire as a pro? Um, is there like me, a series just, of questions you asked yourself or is it just a, yeah, like how did it come about? hundred percent. So one of it was just kind of like after 2019, as, as uh, myself and Jerome said, um, that, that year was just hectic. Uh, it was just event after event after event, come, especially coming from Australia. Uh, once COVID hit, I in hindsight thought it was just going to be a quick little thing that blew over. So in my opinion, I was just going to take maybe a six to, to 12 month break uh, from the, the competitive landscape um, and get back into it. But Australia was completely isolated from that. Um, as you're obviously all aware, like Australian esports still is recovering from, from that COVID uh, situation. The flights to get back into the tournaments is so expensive. Um, so to the questions that I asked myself was just, um, what are my goals at the moment? Uh, COVID's hit, well, nothing's really happening. There's no tournaments being organized. Um, so for me, my priorities was light in just developing myself as a person. So I went back to university, finished my degree because I only had six months left. Um, and then I wanted to get back into it, but there was just nothing. And for me as well, I had like a eye condition. It was like a dry eye syndrome after all the flying, after all the playing, um, staying in air, like hotel air con, um, and it, it just affected my eyes. So I kind of wanted to recover from that as well. And also that's a, a new point that we can kind of touch on is that um, what people get wrong about pros is like, it's such a non-physically demanding, um, I guess, sport is if you want to call it that. Um, and we don't face injuries, but that's completely uh, not true. Like there's a lot of eye injuries that people face. There's ear infections just from like the in ears, like, um, um, and, and even just from a, a burnout perspective, um, it is quite mentally draining. So there are a lot of like factors that come into play that don't really, aren't as well known in traditional sports as they are in esports. Yeah. I got to think back like 10 years ago when I was playing in like one day comps on a Sunday, you know, my team did a lot because we were, you know, pretty underskilled and underdeveloped compared to most other teams. And we'd start, um, you know, warming up for the event at like 8.30 a.m. And then we'd play nonstop online from 10 a.m. until 8.30 p.m. And I just remember like the pure exhaustion after that was done, you know, like I just lay in my bed staring at the ceiling and I can't be bothered getting up to go eat some food. My neck would be killing me. My wrist would be killing me. And I'm like, how the hell is this not a sport? You know what I mean? I feel like I've gone through an MMA fight or something. 
Hundred percent. Those one day comps are absolutely brutal. And when you're playing the game, your brain naturally doesn't think about food or water. So it's like you actually got to force yourself to eat that type of thing because your your hunger is suppressed uh, whilst you're playing video games because you're just so immersed in the game. So um, I think a lot of these teams that do have like those PTs and that that, that support system. I know North when they were a thing, they had um, a PT, a sports psychologist, and two analysts, a coach, an assistant coach. So it is quite ridiculous. We're turning up from Australia with five players, no coach, um, and one manager who does everything social media wise for us, um, tells us where to go, everything. Just for um, anyone in the audience too, we'll open it up soon to like any audience questions you might want to ask as well. So all you got to do is you got to click, there's like a little hand thing you can click to go into like a lobby to be able to ask a question. So then we can bring you up and, and yeah, you can come shoot the shit with us as well and ask what you want. Jake, you got, you got anything else you want to ask or add? Yeah, really, really quick. Wanted to bounce off that that last point too. Uh, it's it's funny because I feel like gamers always get memed for these kind of injuries. And thinking back, I know we focus a lot on CS, but if you think back on it, tons of different esports, it's always pretty detrimental when one of four or one of five, it depend on the esport, one of three players all of a sudden has has an injury, and that can really disturb an entire team. And it's funny how you say you're traveling all the time. You're probably opening up your your body to be way more susceptible to any kind of illness. Uh, of a variety of things, not just the physical exhaustion, but also the mental exhaustion. I, I don't know if you could speak at length of all the things that you've heard about. I mean, I've heard of wrist injuries, hand injuries. I think you go back, some people have had like pectoral injuries, but then uh, alongside that, all of the illnesses from travel and so on. I, I wouldn't mind if you expanded on that too, because I, I feel like a lot of people don't realize how tough that's got to be on your body to, to do that every single day, day in and day out. Hundred percent. When um, teams are flying so much, um, even just from a airplane perspective and traveling to all these different countries, um, you're taking plane rides with recycled aircon. And if someone's sick on that, you're t- almost like, especially if you're taking a thirteen hour flight, unless you have a really strong immune system, you're hundred percent getting sick. Like if, if someone's right next to you coughing and has some sort of illness, and that's uh, you, you can't prevent that. Obviously, you can have your mask, etc., like whatever. Um, preventative measures that you want to take into play, but yeah, there's no avoiding that. Um, when it comes to even just posture, uh, sitting in the gaming chair, I know a lot of people had back injuries. So a few of my teammates even had wrist injuries, as you were saying, one person even had a zist in their wrist and they couldn't play. So that, that made us go a man down, had to get a sub. And in a video game situation, it's, it's quite hard to have a fill in. It's you, yeah, there's so many rounds that have so much strategic depth that you play as a team you rehearse and you talk about that it's really hard to play with any sort of feeling you're at such a disadvantage we also had a teammate who was from mongolia um and because he was from mongolia you couldn't get into certain countries so depending on where the tournament was we'd always have to play with a feeling so there's even that as a restriction yeah and then just one more sorry chris i know we got a few people who want to ask questions too uh I don't know if you guys can speak on this, but I've always wanted to ask players and hopefully we'll ha- ask some more this year as well. We were talking about CSGO major sticker money. And when it comes time for Valorant and what they're doing with giving back, you know, I think it's 50% split of skins go back to players and teams. Uh, we've seen it in TI with Dota as well. CSGO obviously known for their majors. And I believe that the sticker money has grown throughout the years or at least done very, very well. Uh, if, if you could speak to maybe the... Uh, the uh, amount of potentially life-changing money that sticker money could be for a player. I don't know if you guys can name numbers, but I would love to know like a range or a number of, of how exactly making a major in CSGO can change a player's livelihood a little bit. Um, yeah, I think I can, I can speak about that because the figures um, like we'll see for Paris major and uh, I don't have the numbers yet exactly for um, the last major because it's always a bit delayed for the stickers and so on. But I know that because we didn't have a major in live, we didn't have a major for almost two years on CS. And then suddenly we had the, the major in, um, in Stockholm, right? It was the, the after COVID period, the CS being back online with the major, it was pretty hype. So a lot of people bought capsules and, and stickers. And um, I, I know as a fact that the teams that were in the biggest capsule, they had millions, like several millions. And the players were taking a fair share on that. So it was pretty, pretty high. Uh, for some players, it was probably higher than their yearly salary. Um, so yep. it was pretty high. It was probably 200K, 300K in the year. And then you normally have two major per year. But as I said, this major was pretty specific. It was the first one after two years. It was at the end of the year. Um, but you can earn 
a lot of money with the seekers, to be fair. And it's the same on Valorant. Like it depends on the revenue share that you have. But I think we can we can double check the numbers on Valorant for the first champions. Or, or how much was it? It was 14 million divided by the teams. I need to check. But it's uh I think it almost came out to like one million a team or something like that. I think it yeah, it's, I think it was sixteen million for teams and then they divided with the teams that qualified. So it was 30, 32 million and then Riot is taking fifty percent and the teams are taking fifty percent. Um so it was let's say yeah, one million per team, and then you divide like let's say a situation where you are fifty fifty. I don't know, it was not the case for a lot of teams that you are fifty fifty. So it's five hundred K for the players, so it's hundred K per player. Um, and it was only the first year, so I hope that this year will be even higher for the players. Yep, can confirm that as well. Um, so essentially individuals, probably like low end six figures, um, and then organizations for Counter-Strike potentially around the seven figure mark too. Yeah, I remember, uh, I remember talking to like probably a tier two org and them telling me that just by getting into the event, you know, even if they're going to come last, it basically funds their CS team for a year. Their operations cost entirely. Hundred percent. That's what that's what um, a lot of organizations only really care about a lot of the time, especially when you come to the APAC region. Like for any sort of Asian team, to depending on where they're they're living, um, say like IHC who are from Mongolia, them winning sticker money is just ridiculous. It gets them so far within their country. Yeah, damn. There you go. All right. Any anything else you guys want to talk about before we bring up any other any other guests? Um. I can maybe bounce back quickly on the injuries and so on because I've been yeah. uh, I've been working on it a lot and I know that uh, Caleb, the CEO of Adamas, is there. I wanted to like, ask question. They are all partners in anything related to performances, else, and so on. But I've had a lot of players with injuries, like wrist, back, shoulders. Um, highs, hey, um, but also players getting sick because they travel too much and they, they have doctors, they have no idea what they have. I had players where I had to find the best surgeon in the, in the UK, for example, the absolute reference for the end, just to be sure that he will get the, um, like, because you cannot risk um, doing something that the, that the player will not be able to play anymore at the same level. So I've seen a lot of players getting injured and I think the main reason is obviously because they play too much, but it's also because there was and there is still, but we, we are all working on it, a lack of education for the players. Like, like even the top tier players right now, because they have been playing the game for 15 years since they are, I don't know, 10, they, they don't even stretch before playing. Like they play eight hours, they don't even stretch before, during, after. They just go on the PC and they play. Like obviously, when you do that for ten years, then you will have uh, probably injury. You will have pain in your uh, in your hand. You will have pain in the wrist. You will have pain in the shoulder because you don't have the great posture. You have, let's say, it also in esports, we created some gaming chairs that are really bad. It's really <laughs> shit. So you are sitting ten hours a day on really really bad chairs that are not at all efficient for your posture, and you don't have any education on how to anticipate that or you don't want to think about it because you are young like at the beginning you are 17 you your, your back is not hurting and then when, when you are 33 like hurst and i can tell you that it's hurting a lot because i've been playing way too much um and <laughs> that's also something that we need to work on that's why we work with adamas for example and that's why a lot of organizations start to have physio pt uh, sport psychologists and so on is because we need to educate the, the players especially when they are young that if they don't do that, then maybe, yeah, maybe for two years, three years, it will be okay. But maybe in five years, it will be the best in the world, but he will not be able to play anymore. He, he will need to, to stop playing because after 10 minutes of death match on the CS, he cannot hold the mouse anymore. And the reason is that because he didn't anticipate or we didn't as the support of the player. And that's something that is important that, in my opinion, the players, they don't consider enough. Like, we push for it a lot. They they don't seem to care. Like if you don't force them to do so, it's like, yeah, good. It's, it's like we need, we will need the coaches before playing every day saying, no, you need to stretch. Like we, we you have 20 minutes stretching, then we will play like you do in football. Right. Um, but most of the teams, they don't do that. The players, they don't do that themselves. Uh, I remember being at the Varoan champions uh, with a team that we have a lot of players in the team. And I said, um, okay, you're going to play. Are you stretching? Did you, I don't know, do you have any exercise that we sent you that you're doing? They said, what, what do you mean? 
I said, guys, we have a Discord, a performance Discord for you. We we briefed you about that. We said you you need to check and uh, let's check because some of them have they have respawn, and then they say, oh okay, I'm going to check again. Then they check, they launch the video, and I said, you need to do that every day. Did you do it already? No, but why? Because we explained it to you, and we say, yeah. Well, we don't know. And then they started doing it because I was there with them. And they say, yeah, we should do that every day. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that after Champions, they have not done it once. Right? And that's something that is a big trouble in esports is that the players, they don't see the value of it. But it's mandatory. Like you are not a, a pro football player, a soccer player, sorry guys, um, or football player or NBA player if you don't stretch, if you don't take care of your body, if you don't anticipate that. And that's the same in esports. It's just different things to take care. But if you don't do it, then yeah, for sure, you will have a, a lot of pain when you will be older. That's just uh... good luck what trying to you, convince Ollie, what's me your to stretching not... routine. Stretching routine? No, oh, mate. Just get some morning sun, lay down on the ground, read my Bible. That's it. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, yeah. we have stretching routines for our players. We have videos that our partners and other must did, and uh, awesome. But most of them, they don't do it. And then after that, they complain. Ah, I'm, I have pain in my hands. Say, yeah, but that's why you yeah. need to do it. Or I know it, like- it, takes, it takes five minutes, but please do it. It's like, Chris, you're doing a lot of workouts, right? Even you, Jake. Like, you need to do it before and after. Or it's, if you don't do it, fine. But you know that it will hurt someday. Yeah, I've, right. I've still got some wrist and neck problems from when, I, from when I was playing pro. Like after those one day comps, I used to have a screen. I didn't realize that you needed to, you know, have a screen that wasn't really low, right? So I used to sit pretty close to the screen like my CS players do with my keyboard turned diagonal and I'd be looking down the entire day and I get to the end of the day and I couldn't move like my head left and right. I get like shooting pain, you know, down my back and spine. So imagine, you know, like you were saying, imagine doing that for 15 plus years. I was only trying to be a pro for like three or four, you know? Good luck trying to convince me, though, to use the um, ergonomic chair versus a pretty cool-looking racer one, <laughs> especially when I was 17. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they do pretty cool ergonomic chair now, right? Yeah. <laughs> pretty expensive, but it's also cool. So. Hey, Jeremy, did you say uh, Caleb, who's asking to come up to speak, is he one of your partners that, that works on that kind of stuff? Yeah, exactly. I'll He's bring him the up. CEO of Adamas, um, which is probably the best esports company working on the and performances for the players. They're really, okay. really amazing. They support uh, our players, our academies. They work with uh, teams. I mean, he can introduce himself, but they are really, really great. And I, I, I wish that we were able to use them more. It's just on the player. I cannot force the players. So <laughs> You can try, huh? Yeah. Uh, set him allowed to speak. Here we go. He's in. Caleb, hello. Hey, guys. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, hello? Hello? You guys can hear me, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, yes. we can. Okay. We got you. It's just a bit cool. laggy when you talk and the, the thing, like, the, the circular fair, thing. Fair enough. Thanks for having me on. And uh, it's a great discussion. Well done, all. Important topics. Um, my my question uh, was, and it relates to injuries, among other things, is when when do you think we'll get to the point of having larger team rosters so that teams can manage injuries better, but also <clears throat> maybe even more importantly, being able to manage behavior issues and team dynamic situations in a in a more proactive and performance enhancing way. And I mean, I guess part of my assumption would be that maybe player salaries need to either adjust or reven- the teams need to make more revenue so that they can carry more talent on their teams. But I'd be curious as to uh, your all of your thoughts on on that because I think that's the obvious kind of solution to reduce burnout um, help manage injuries as well as the the, the team dynamic uh, and behavioral situations that happen in all these teams 100% um, for, for me personally coming from a competitive uh, player standpoint uh, it's pretty hard to have any sort of if it's a five man game, like a, like any sort of subs, like a six man roster, seven man roster, what it is, just because there's so much depth to certain video games. I know it depends on the esport title, but say Counter Strike, for example, because it's probably the game I'm most informed on. Um, there's that many reactions, uh, strategic depth, um, just even practicing within the team. That if you have more hours than the sub, you're obviously going to be better. And I think it makes like a such a 
big impact that's kind of intangible. You can't really track it. Um, so from that standpoint for esports titles, such as Counter-Strike, um, even Valorant as well, I think it's pretty hard to play with a sub. Um, I think the best way to avoid any sort of physical, like the preventative measures for those titles would just be, as um, Jeremiah was saying, um, just your mobility training, like, the, like your sports psychologist, your PT to really educate you on what's best for you. I know for me personally as well, um, just from trial and error, I couldn't even do certain gym workouts. I can't train back and arms um, because of my forearm when I'm playing. Um, I would start to develop a twitch in my forearm. Like So there's even that little thing um, to, to come into play. But I'd say maybe potentially for Rocket League that I'm not too involved formed on how much depth it really has i definitely think you can have subs and then depending on the the amount of tournaments there are and the, the potential for burnout and potential for injuries um i think subs are a really good option for for other titles but for counter-strike for me i don't think is a viable option uh, yeah i think it's it's pretty hard and there are a lot of reasons i think you you, you touch one caleb is that obviously the cost um will be more expensive or the other players will need to reduce the salaries, which is not something that the player really want to do. And I think the main challenge on most of the games is that the esports compared to sport is changing so fast. The contracts are not very, and they are not all secured as it is in sport because of regulations and so on. And I think Oliver will know that better than mine than me because he played at a way higher level. But your place in the roster is never safe, never. And if you accept to have a sub on CS or any other game, and then you don't play one map, you don't play one game, and then these players start to pop off, then the day after they can just say, "No, we're not going to do a six-man roster. You will become the sub, and you will not play anymore because this guy is so good." And you just gave a chance. So a lot of players are very, very against having subs because of that. And it's just they are just competitors, right? It just makes sense. It's a game where you play at three, four, or five. It's not a, a soccer uh, when you play at uh, eleven players, and then you have uh, physical cap capabilities, and then you can change the players depending on the match. It doesn't change that much. It changed maybe the quality, but if you have good subs, it's still you're still a good team. If you change one player on CS, one player on Valorant, one player on Rocket League, it's even worse. Then you can break all the chemistry of the team, and you can you can go from the best in the world to a top fifty team or losing against random teams because you don't have the chemistry. Um, so it's really hard in esports. You have some games. I, th I think the only games where it can make sense right now is where you have very specific roles. Like Overwatch, they try to do it because you have very specific roles and you have agents or heroes on Overwatch where you can have the best Genji in the world. And if you need a Genji on the map, you will put your, the Genji. And if you need a tracer or DPS that is a normal DPS, you need to shoot, maybe you will, you will, you will use the, be the best eat scan player you have. That, that makes sense because it's, it's very different. But on a lot of games like Rocket League, CSGO, Valorant, Valorant maybe with the, with the agents, you can have the best Sentinel in the world and the second best and you change it. I don't know. Um, some teams are trying, but we never saw um, any success, maybe Vitality on CS a little bit, but it was uh, okay-ish, but I know that the players didn't really enjoy it at the end. Um, so it's really hard. Is it needed? I don't know. Um, will it be a standard in the future? I don't think so. I, I don't see how it can work with eSport being that competitive for the players. And if I was a player myself right now, Chris before, like there is no way I say, uh, I accept if the organization is saying you don't have the choice, then you do it, right? But there is no way that I willingly give my spot in the team risking to lose my contract like one month after because... I don't know, because I'm not playing uh, all the maps and this guy is better than me and suddenly they want to play the major with him and I, we, can ha we cannot have a sub in the major, right? That's usually what happens in, in some games. So that's the reality of it. It's really complicated to make it work. I was going to say off that, when I played, um, you were made a sub and usually that meant we're too scared to kick you from the team. So you're now a sub. <laughs> That's usually what that meant. I was interested in um, both Ollie and, and Jeremy's opinion on this then. What about, like I, I did a podcast with Talon Esports. So for those who don't know, that they're, they're in, uh, they're like a Taiwanese League of Legends team. They're based out of Hong Kong, the best in their region. And the way that they do it is kind of like a football manager 
IRL. So they hire a coach, give the coach a salary cap, and then the coach goes and makes the team, which is more of like a traditional standpoint of creating things. And as far as I'm aware, most esports teams still operate kind of how they did five, 10 years ago. Just interested in getting your guys' opinion on that. I mean, I don't know. It's more management, financial managing question that I don't know. Uh, like think about it from, yeah, they are burning money. Way, like, we know it, but I will assume that most of the organizations they work with a budget, right? And maybe you can you can stretch it a little bit if you want the best in the world. But I, I don't know. I assume at least that they have a budget when they start negotiating with me. Um, I hope so. If not, that's maybe part of the problem. <laughs> but uh, but I think esports organizations are starting to get maybe more reasonable, and they have to follow the cost and, and the PNL. Um, so obviously they have a cap, like internally, I, I assume they have a cap, maybe not, uh, maybe they but, just have a rough budget, but, uh, think about it from the way of like, you know, the old, the old school of CS is like, you know, I won't come unless the other guy who holds B with me is there. I've played with this guy for six years. So if I join a team, he has to join a team. Whereas Talon took it from the standpoint of the coach is the, you know, be all end all of this. He gets a salary cap. He picks all the players one by one and they try to operate a little bit more like a professional sports team. That, that's kind of the angle I was coming at. Well, I think that's the case now in most of the games. Um, obviously, the players, the best players, the IGS and so on, they have a huge voice on the players they want. But I think that the organization has take, are starting to get the power of decision right now, which just makes sense, right? They are supposed to be the one, except sometimes you can have coaches that are supposed to be knowledgeable, but they are not compared to the players because the players are the one playing every day, knowing all the players, the play style that they need. Um, so you, the players still have a big voice, but I think right now a lot of organizations have a lot of uh, uh, decision-making they have the final word usually, except, I don't know, maybe if you have the best player in the world and then he says, no, I don't want this player, maybe, right? But I agree with you. Like, it, it depends on the game. Rocket League is because the players are very young. Um, it's really hard to force players playing with others, I think. But in the top tier games, like League of Legends, 100%. League of Legends is done by the organization, the coaching staff. The um, They are taking the decision right now. That's for sure. Sweet. Dan, welcome up. Um, so Dan, who's just come up to ask a question, um, so you guys know he runs a huge school-based esports program for the younger side of kids in um, based around, mainly around the Nintendo Switch. So Dan, what do you got to ask, brother? Sorry, can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah, man. Uh, awesome. Hey, thanks so much for organizing this. It's been incredible. Thanks to uh, all the... Uh, you know, Oliver and Jeremy and, and Jake, your, your insights have been really, really cool. I'd love hearing the uh, the fact that, you know, you're talking about injury prevention and something um, that's really passionate that we're, we're kind of working on at the moment. Um, you know, looking at at all of our competitions, making sure all of our players stretch before we start. And I guess we've got the luxury being the tournament organiser where we can do that. You know, we can physically watch everyone uh, stretch and and kind of work through those exercises. But I guess what I wanted to ask each of you is, you know, we've got a lot of players across Australia that are aspiring to kind of either, you know, be a pro player or work in the space or just work in the gaming industry at all, at any kind of capacity. So I just wanted to kind of pick your brains as to like, what's one tip or one kind of piece of wisdom that you would share with, you know, like a you know 13 year old who, who is so passionate about gaming and esports that this is what they want to do. Do you want to go, Oliver? Yeah, I'll go first. That's fine. Um, essentially, we'll share our advice. Um, mine would just be just enjoy the process. I don't think you should accept any sort of expectations on yourself. I know it's hard to say, say that to a 13-year-old, um, but just thoroughly enjoy the process. Um, join a team like an open qualifier or any sort of open league with mates, like whether it's Rocket League, um, whatever game they're playing, um, and just focus on getting better together. I think that's the best way um, you develop, like even just from a gaming perspective, I've never really regretted making a team with certain mates, even if it hasn't gone like to plan. Uh, I think it's a learning experience and such a great social activity that um, it's just developed my skill set as a person. So I just tell them to focus on um, the pro enjoying the process. Don't really focus too much on what game is relevant. It's going to, what's going to make you the most money. Um, Cause you, when being a 13 year old, you don't, you don't know what game is going to be relevant in X amount of years when you, when you want to turn professional. Um, 
So yep. yeah, my, my, my advice would just be uh, for them to enjoy the process and um, go down more of a, if you, if you can put it onto them, just like more of a professional avenue, like, like teach them about preventative measures for injuries, um, teach them like what it takes to, to be a, be a, a professional athlete in, in general, even in traditional sports, giving you examples of what like their daily life has to, has to include. I think we'll just only pay dividends for them. Yeah. Cool. Thanks, man. Um, yeah, maybe I can give some perspective on working in esports or gaming and not necessarily wanting to become a pro player, right? Uh, because obviously that's an industry, you have a lot of work, a lot of job, all verticals. Even if organizations are struggling a little bit, you still have a lot of companies, publishers, agencies, and so on to work in. But I think the most important thing, it just seems obvious, but if you want to work in esports, like that's your dream, um, you are... 13, 15, then obviously focus on studies first. It's just, it just makes sense if you want to work later in esports. Um, focus on studies. Don't focus too much on esports, in my opinion, in the studies. Like, I don't really, I mean, you have some some school that are esports focused that are okay, but I think you, you just need to, to do standard studies, like, I don't know, business school and so on, learning all the basics of everything. And then specializing in esports on the side, if you want, walking. Uh, my best advice for the studies, for example, that's what I did myself, that's what I think is the most valuable, is what we call in France, I have no idea how you call that, but it's, I think it's sandwich course or something like that. Uh, but it's, uh, you, it's alternance in France, it's when you go to studies, but you also work at the same time and you are getting paid, like a small salary, but you are getting paid for the full year. Um, that's what I did for my studies. That's what a lot of people I know did. And that's oh. the best, that's the best thing to do because you learn how to work. You, le you learn so much during three, four, five years and you have the diploma at the end. And obviously you can try to find something in esports if you want. And then at the end you can, you can, you can find a job normally. I wouldn't say it's easy, but it's easier because you have three, four years of experience and you have a diploma. Um, that's my absolute goal. Um, recommendation for anyone who wants to do studies and work um, because that's that's also what I'm looking for as a, a CEO of a company, right? If someone is finishing studies and has been working for four years, he has some experience, that's, that's potentially a very good candidate compared to someone that has done normal studies, didn't work yet, and didn't see anything outside of books. That's, that's really, really harder to find a job. And, and to work in eSport, I think it has changed. But I think I'm pretty sure that everyone in this call did work as a benevolent, did a lot of work without getting paid in eSport before, just for passion in side project, personal project. And that's how you learn also the ropes of eSports. Um, nowadays, normally you should be able to find some proper work without being unpaid. And I don't recommend to be unpaid, but um, just digging into it, trying to work, trying to... Trying to learn how it's working in esports, creating your network and trying to translate the skills that you learn during your work into esports. This is the best way to do it. Um, but I wouldn't recommend to focus only on esports. Like if you want to work in esports, don't focus only on that. Try to open up your mind, trying to work on different things and maybe come back in esports when you have uh, opportunities to do so. Because you never know how esports will develop. At least esports, I'm talking esports, like gaming is going well. Um, that would be my recommendation. It's a bit wide, but um, I know a lot of people always ask me, what do you recommend for studies, for example? Like, if I want to work at Prodigy, what studies I need to do? What do I need to do? Um, and that's always my advice. Try to work at the same time as uh, doing the studies. That's how you find a job in the end. Quick thing for you, Dan. Was that purely for esports player or is that just a general gaming question? Uh, just, just more of a general gamer question. I mean, when when kids come to us and say, "I want to be a pro player," like we very carefully say, "That's great," but you know, yeah. just like anything, to become a professional is the absolute, you know, top of the top. There's a whole industry around it. There's other other jobs and vocations that you can be involved in the gaming and esports industry without necessarily being a top tier player. So I guess it's more just a broad, you know, kind of question around. And I love the, yeah. the advice so far. 
hundred percent. Yeah. It is like, like a broad answer as well from our perspective, just like in moderation and then just try to develop your skill set in areas related to gaming. Like I'd say if I was 13, I'd definitely want someone just to help me with any sort of like video editing as well. I think that's a yeah, key yeah. component that can just develop your skill set so much that goes hand in hand, both with a professional career and any sort of gaming um, qualification. Um, and who knows, you might actually end up loving like video editing and develop a passion for that. And you could be quite successful from a young age if you start learning that. Yeah, that's, I that's think it's very advice. individual dependent as well. Mm. Yeah, I think that's sound advice too. There's there's a bunch of skill sets out there that have a bunch of uh, you know crossover with with a lot of things. Just like when it comes to education, right? Having that firm backing behind you, uh, just in case things don't work out, is a great idea. You also got to love it. But having on those skill sets, like video editing, has great crossover into so many areas of life, especially now with everything taking off on the internet. And I would just say, be a, be a sponge, take in everything you possibly can. If you enjoy content, watch as much of it as you, as is healthy to learn more about the space that you want to get into. That's uh, at least coming from me. You know, if you want to learn about streamers, watch a lot of the streamers and their content, go to events. If you want to be a pro player, same thing, go to events, absorb as much as possible and see if it's something you actually want to pursue. Trent, what's going on, man? What do you, what do you got to ask? Hey guys, I appreciate appreciate the time you've given us. Also, Jake, don't listen to him. I find you on YouTube, not Twitter. So you're you're great. Oh man, that's my man, friend. <laughs> um, yeah, I so I'm coming at this from a perspective of you talk a lot about like you either win and you get noticed, or you don't win and you don't get noticed. And I was curious as a team who might be struggling, like what metrics do coaches focus on? How do they track performance? Because, right, if you're, you're not always going to come in first place. So how do you still like how do you tell your team you're doing better or you're getting better? How do you measure these like performance metrics? I'm really curious to know what esports does for that. Uh, in game, depending on the situation, but like you don't really know the full picture until you're in the voice communication, like like of, of like how impactful certain players are, um, how they handle pressure, uh, how they practice, like what the quality of the practice versus um, game day performance. Like like are they really good in practice? And then they they they're not very good when it comes to the actual performance and uh, where it matters. Um, I think there's a lot of factors that come into play. How you measure that is just all into one, to be honest. Like obviously you have your statistics that you can just follow and they paint a certain picture. Obviously if someone's got a negative kill death ratio in a game that's called like a FPS shooter um, and they've consistently got this detrimental statistics, you know, obviously you can analyze that and have a pretty good picture that they're not very, uh, they're not performing very well. Um, and what adjustments you just, pretty much talk to that person one-on-one, -on -one, like what do you feel uncomfortable with, et cetera, get the team's thoughts. Um, but there are a lot of other factors that in my opinion are almost hard to measure. And that can just be like team, as, as uh, Jeremiah was saying before, like team chemistry. Um, there's a lot of positive impact, say Carrigan, for example, who plays for FaZe Clan. Um, previously, like his in-game leader skills trumped any sort of statistical or negative statistics that he, he may have had just peculiarly because of how good he was at u utilizing his players. So that comes into play. I think uh, depending on the role as well, like are they playing a role on in Counter-Strike that doesn't get as much, it's not a star role. You're not going to get as many frags, but you've got such an important area to, to lock down using your utility. Um, how do they use that utility? That comes into the picture as well. So performance metrics statistics is definitely number one and what everyone tracks and it's got the most public attention to it but i think there's a lot of important factors that come into play um including communication how you handle pressure that coaches have to take in consideration and get the help to to their players to see if they can improve that give them a certain like uh, timeline to improve that if they don't then changes need to happen yeah i agree with that i think what we have in esports is that because we play on PC or console, but a lot of games are on PC and we play online, or at least we have the server, we have access to a lot of data, which is a good thing. But as Oliver said, it, it depends on the specific picture, but you can see a lot in the numbers, uh, not only on the kill dish ratio and so on, but you can see the impact of the player, the opening keys. You can see a lot of things. Um, that's the, let's say, the easiest path to analyze the performance. You know that when your team is losing, when your team is winning, uh, the, the performances of each players, and you can analyze and, okay, we are not in a good form right now. But then you you, need, you obviously need to go deeper because uh, the players are humans. They are not robots. 
So maybe there is a reason why this player is not performing at his best. Maybe it's the position. Maybe he just have a hard time in his life for whatever reason. And you need to find the tool to and, and the means to allow him to bounce back and being at the top again and working with the team. So there are a lot of things to analyze for coaches, managers um, that are very similar to sports. Um, except that in esports, the teams, it's, it's like three, four, five players. It's not 11 players and you can replace one player that is not playing well for three months. You cannot, you cannot really allow a player to not play well for three months. Usually what happens in esports, if a player is playing bad, um, at least not up to the performances that the coach wants, then he will be benched after a few months. That's just reality of it. The players, they don't have the time to bounce back on esports, which is a big issue because you lack security. And I don't know, you can, you can lose someone close to you. That, that's the case I had with the player. He lost his best friend. And so it was a really, really hard time for him. He was really close to him and he, he struggled for a few months. What happened? Even if the team understood that he wanted to give his best, but it was really hard for him to, to be at his best, they, they just benched him because they don't have six months to wait for him to be back on shape, unfortunately, in esports. And they cannot really put him on the, I don't know, as a sub and going back for some matches, they just bench and terminated him at some point when he wanted to go. That's the reality of esports also. Oh, yeah. Another one for you, Justin, as well. Um, so from an example, a, a t previous team I played with, we had an in-game leader who was a very extroverted person, could articulate his thoughts way better than others. And he would get extremely negative when rounds didn't go the certain way. Like he would um, bully players. Um, and a lot of gamers, like as a generalization, I a lot of them are introverted people um and within our team in that dynamic like personally i didn't really care i was like oh what's wrong with this guy like why is he saying this but the other players like it took a negative impact on their performance like having an in-game leader having a person who um was calling the rounds for us our strategy and then being in in my opinion a bully like like that made a, such a negative impact on these players and you wouldn't know that unless you listen, listen to our voice comms like you think it would have just bad at the game but these like the three other players on our team were um it created like a negative culture and uh, that severely impacted the performance of certain individuals and the trust within the team so that's like another i guess perspective when it comes to chemistry and uh personalities within the team how people handle their losses um especially in a game in the gaming world where people might not have um real world experience you've got 17 year olds in your team who are absolutely incredible talent but they might not have that like real world experience where they've um they've taken losses before they, they know how to maturely take losses they know how to take on constructive criticism um so the culture that's set is is really important and can uh eat, eat, eat from the inside and i was going to say my girlfriend of six years dumped me like three weeks before our biggest ever cs tournament so i get where you're going from that was rough <laughs> <laughs> brutal <laughs> you know, it's, it's funny all you were saying that too. I remember with my team, like, I feel like every team has a serial whinger, right? And we used to have these times, you know, when you're like playing train and, uh, or, or like nuke and you're on T side and you just can't get a breakthrough. You're getting, you're getting just slapped down. We used to try to do something to break that up where we just go on an eco round, sit outside and just talk to each other. And it was either me as like the second secondary kind of in-game leader or in-game leader would just ask people directly. Like we just sit there and say, you know, Ollie, what's going wrong? Like, what do you think we should do to try to like pull people's head out of just screaming and being angry at each other? hundred percent. And it's all about team perspective. Cause like that one person's perspective, you don't like, like you don't have an eagle eye view of the game. You, you've just got a tunnel vision on, on your perspective. So you've got to reach out to those people who may be introverted and not talking up. Like uh, one thing with my game leader who we did really well with Dexter, who's performing really well overseas. And I'm not too sure if he's with prodigy agency, uh, Jeremiah Dexter. Yes, he is. Yeah. Legend. Um, yeah. like he was really good at getting information and like creating a positive culture to be like, um, what's going wrong over here. And like, like I said, Ollie on that side of the map, what's happening? What are the, what are they doing to, that's making it difficult or uncomfortable for you to, to play. And I'd share my perspective and him being the in-game leader then provided a strat offer that won us the next round when we we're in a difficult situation and having a couple rounds loss. So perspective is just so important having that positive culture and to, to be open with each other. Um, and, and not getting called like a pussy if you're, if you're performing negatively. Justin, what's going on, man? What do you want to ask? Um, well, first off, thanks for doing this. This has been interesting to listen to. Um, yeah, it's always good to get some perspective from locals and overseas guys as well. Um, what I was wanting to ask is a bit more of a, a lighter question. Um, which 
if you had to pick one esport event that's happened in the last 20 years, which one was the best one and why? Hmm. That's a, that's a tough question. That is. Uh, for me, probably I am Sydney 2019 because it was awesome. It's in my hometown and I felt like an absolute champion there. Um, and then overseas tournament, it would be probably the Berlin major just because the major is such a prestigious event. There's so much effort that goes into it, um, especially when you're in a uh, it complements it when you, you're in a very cool location like Berlin in Germany. It's so different to um, where I live and Australia in general. Um, so those two events definitely are highlights for me. Um, I think tournament organizers at the moment treat players and staff like so, so well, maybe not um, staff too much, but the players get such a Royal treatment. So um, in my opinion, those, those two events stand up. Um, for me, I, I would start with, uh, I mean, it's very controversial and so on. It's um, the CSGO major in Rio in 2022. I was there on site for the full event, like two, two weeks and a half. And it was at the same time, the best event I've ever attended um, as a CSGO fan, as an agent, as everything you want, when the Brazilian teams were playing. Like I was in the arena when Furia won against Navi in the quarterfinal. That was the craziest match and the craziest crowd I've ever experienced in esports. I had to wear earbuds to not to be able to hear properly after the match. And that was really crazy. The, the atmosphere was insane. A lot of people, a lot of people inside, outside. But at the same time, when the Brazilian teams were not playing, it was almost empty and everyone was outside in the fan fest. I'm pretty sure you, you learn about you You read about that. But so yeah, that was, cool. that was the, the very best event when Brazilian teams were playing super crazy and when the Brazilian teams were not playing it was yeah is it really a major right now or is it like just a, a local LAN it was really a weird feeling and I think the other one would be again the CSGO major in Antwerp 2022 it was the biggest um, inside arena in Europe 22,000 people I think and it was fully packed and they filled it for the world playoffs and it was really great. Like the atmosphere was crazy. The fans were thinking, even when like the Vitality fans, because it was in Belgium and the, the French people came, they were, they were screaming, they were shouting, they were, and Vitality was not even playing. They were just celebrating Counter Strike. And it was really, really crazy. And then we had also an amazing final, right? We had the uh, Navi against FaZe, uh, probably the best final you can imagine on CS at the time. Um, that was probably the best. The best experience as a viewer, but not the best experience as an event because it was, sorry, but it was PGL. And I think that they were not the best for the production and also taking care of the players on site. Like ESL and Blast are really top tier for that. But it was really a great event to experience. I think that was probably the two best ones. And usually CSGO is, CSGO is producing the best events in my opinion. Maybe... If you go to the League of Legends walls, the big fight, the grand final, that's also crazy. But usually the rest of the event is okay to attend, but it's not that crazy as a CSGO major, in my opinion. What about you, Jack? Event. What do you think? Uh, I'm a bit biased uh, as a NA guy. So E-League Boston major for CS from a viewership experience. Uh, <laughs> shouts, but I, I guess when it comes to attendance, I'll, I'll sway a little bit. Uh, every CS event I've ever attended has always been lit because that's... I'm biased towards, but I think Rocket League does a great job too. Uh, RLCS Dallas, I believe last year, uh, I went to a couple of different Rocket League majors, but when it comes time for treating talent and, uh, you know, really just showing us around the whole venue and loading a venue out with, a, I believe, 17,000 people, um, I think Rocket League is very, very underrated still when it comes time for an in-person esports event. Obviously, CS is still a mainstay for me, but yeah, E-League Boston and then RLCS Dallas last year. I think I agree with you. Like Rocket League is probably my favorite esport right now with CS because the game is just, I mean, it's easy to watch for everyone, but it's just crazy. It never stops. You cannot breathe. Like it's great to watch, but when you represent players, for example, you are stressed. Like the last major in, Rot in uh, Rotterdam, we had the three players in the final. They lost, unfortunately, but it was so stressful. 
but it's so great to watch. It's uh, it's so intense. You don't have a break. Um, the spectacle is really crazy. But usually the events on Rocket League, they are not as big as CSGO, except the Worlds again, only one event per year. While the Major, you have like 300 people. I don't know. It depends on the Major, maybe maybe 4,000 for the biggest ones. Uh, while on CSGO, on all, all the big events, the Majors, you have like 15, 20k people, depending on the events. So. But hopefully Rocket League catch up on that. They have everything needed. And you, Chris, by the way. It's probably got to be the same as Ollie, which is I am Sydney. Just because, you know, Australia doesn't get a chance quite often. And I feel like as far as insane CSGO live audiences go, whether there's a lot of people or not, it's got to be Brazil number one and Australia a very close number two. So that was that was definitely fun to see for sure. Either that or it's uh, got to be the Miami Vale Major, which is where I met Jake Lucky and Hunter Grooms in person for the first time. So, you know, <laughs> they're, they're both up there. Oh, all you Sydney guys, it's unfair. I can't get on a flight for that long, man. <laughs> I really do. I, I can't one. fly well. I got back problems. I don't know how you guys do it. There was um, a flight that we did. It was from um, Melbourne to, to Poland and it was 47 hours. It was three legs. It was Jeez. a horrible experience. You should Whoa. get on that one, Jake. Get well, on that how- one. <laughs> You're a changed man after that kind of experience. <laughs> yeah, it was rough. I did 30 hours from Miami back to Australia once because they sent me the wrong way around the world, essentially. I went through Europe. So I went like Miami to Qatar and then Qatar to Australia. It was like 16 plus 14 or something like that. It was it was stupid. Get a shower after that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a long flight. I reckon. I had one one last question uh, that someone was messaging me who, who doesn't want to ask um, in the voice. So they just shot me through a DM. It's an interesting one. So the question is it's kind of a two part. Number one, do we think players are overpaid or underpaid in general? And then can we expect a correction this year with what's happening with these esports teams? Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I don't think the, pay are, the players are overpaid, but obviously it's, it's my position. Um, I think... Like I know a lot of people also try to put the blame on the players or the agents, but at the end of the day, if the teams are ready to accept and pay that, it, it's, it's not the fault of the players or the agents, right? It's just the market price. Uh, yeah, of course, we increase the market price because of the value of the players, but at the end of the day, it's the organization we accept and sign the contract. So if they have financial issues after that, it's it's on them, right? They could, they could refuse or they could say, no, we cannot. Uh, but at Overall, I don't think the players are overpaid. Um, it, but obviously, if you take into perspective that some of those organizations are losing money, you could say they are overpaid for those organizations. Yes. But at the same time, that's the main value that they have. As an, as an esports organization, the main asset that you have are the players. And I think it's mainly the fact that the team struggle to develop revenue streams and capitalize on the players and the image. Right now, the big teams, they are building massive like i mean for some of them they have um fan base and viewership and so on they just struggle to monetize that once they will succeed to find a way to monetize the audience and the fan base and the players that they have then it will be better but it's not easy i'm not saying it's easy i'm not saying i have the all the solutions i have some but uh, i'm working on it with the players directly not the teams and it's going well uh, like the final most tense thing uh, which could be game changer for teams to do for example but they don't um but i don't think they are overpaid i think if the players that are getting paid a lot they are the superstars of the game they are the main reason why the fans are watching the events, right? When you are the best player in the world on CS, that's why everyone is watching. That's when you have, you have 1.52 million follow, uh, viewers. That's why the sponsors are on the event. That's why everyone is generating revenue. I think the main, the main struggle right now is that most of the revenue are going to the publisher. It's not the players that are earning the, the most, even if compared to the organization, yes. But I think the publishers are taking everything right now. Like if, yeah, if the teams agree. are finding and the teams and the publishers find a way to redistribute more, like we talk about stickers and so on, but it's still minimal compared to the publisher's revenue. And if if we find ways to redistribute to the teams, I think it will be game changer for everyone. 
And it's not because the player will get paid 5k less per month that it will be game changer for an organization losing millions, to be honest. Um, so we need to find a balance. Maybe we will see regulation on, on some salaries. I honestly think that it's doable for a lot of players, like the tier two players or the tier one players, like the normal ones. For the top tier players, there is no way because the teams, they need them, they want them. So there is always a, a fight to get the player and it just makes sense. You want the best in the world in your team if you want to be the best team. For the other players and the standard, the, let's say the average salary, maybe. Maybe it will uh, lower a little bit. I don't think it will be lowering that much, but yeah. Hmm. I've had a, I've had a lot of discussions about this. Some of my thoughts. Um, I think Australia is a canary in the coal mine a lot in in regards to like esports and player salaries, and I think there will be some sort of correction coming, but especially just for the ones that are wildly unprofitable. So it makes sense, you know, paying one of the greats like Simple or Zywu or Tens or someone like that a decent salary, right, with the attention they can bring to you. But what we saw here in Australia is that investors are much um, much more risk adverse here as well as brands and sponsors are much more risk adverse. And things got really overblown, I think, in CS for a while, which kind of started with King's Gaming Club. Um, and it started a lot as well with the Oceanic Pro League here with League of Legends, where players with you know 150 Twitter followers were demanding $45,000 a year salaries to play in the OPL, which had a concurrent viewership of like three to 4,000 average and sometimes sitting underneath that. So if you think from just like a very general return on investment perspective, you know, when we were sponsoring, like when I, when I worked at a peripheral company and I was sponsoring an esports team in Australia, I gave them seven and a half K a quarter for their entire esports team. So you think about that, that doesn't even cover, you know, one player's salary for the entire year. And then you can probably have six sponsors at most. And we were overpaying compared to what some of the other sponsors were in the region too. So there's already been like a lot of a correction in that kind of market. Um, you know, and there was a lot of overinvestment from the OPL. And that was part of my 2023 pre trends predictions where I think we'll see that starting to come a little bit more into the tier two and tier three in EU and NA where some teams will start to be sold as distressed assets to other teams. Some teams will merge and um, other esports companies will see the same. So like specifically in Australia, we saw that. So there's a team here called, um, there was a team here called Avant Esports and they were big into CSGO and, and um, into League of Legends, et cetera. And I sponsored them, you know, when I worked at a brand and I know the amount of money that they got invested in at, and I know the valuation. And then about four years later, they sold for about just under a quarter, around a fifth of what their original valuation was. And their sale was actually 80% made up of just what sponsor funds were coming in. So the brand was worth, you know, almost nothing in the end. Um, and this was one of the teams that was, you know, being asked to pay players those 45K salaries, they just simply couldn't recoup. So, yeah, I think we might see, like my answer is, I think we might see some pullback on some salaries, but, you know, like you were saying, Jeremy, like it makes sense. If you've got a player who can sell seven and a half million dollars worth of mice, like why are you not going to, you know, treat him with the respect and the salary he deserves? But from talking to traditional sports people, it seems that esports is very similar to boxing, MMA and tennis in the sense where, yeah, if you're Conor McGregor, you can make a bunch of money or Tyson Fury in boxing or, you know, name whoever um, in tennis. But once you start getting away from that top 1%, it falls off a cliff where there's tennis players competing at the Australian Open who are, you know, 60th in the world and they're struggling to earn like 25K a year playing professional tennis, having to coach people. And similar to the discussion that's happening around MMA, which is a sport that I follow a lot, where, you know, there's fighters in the UFC that are fighting on like a $12,000 a fight contract. And then after they pay their coach and their trainers and their gym and their manager, they're walking away with about $6,000 to get punched in the face on, on live TV for a living and, you know, literally have their arm and face broken and things like that too. So, yeah, it's a bit of a, a doom and gloom, I guess, answer for me there. But, you know, I think that's, that's what I'm seeing in the market anyway from my side. Yeah, I agree with all those points as well. Um, as a generalization, I don't think they're overpaid. Like, I think it's just the market and the publisher that really need to um, sort their stuff out. Like, uh, a lot of the time, people just see like esports. Oh, it's growing. Let's just throw money in the pot and see where it goes. Like, from a non-endemics perspective, um, especially to your points, Chris, as well with um, the Kings or even Order, for example, um, just investing with little to no growth plan um, and utilizing like that relationship between the players and trying to monetize that. It's it obviously it's no, it's not easy. It's so uh, industry perspective, like, like um, industry specific 
player specific um, and team specific, esports specific, um, and you got to really develop um, a growth plan that's specific to that player, like and monetize that team. Like, so there are so many factors that really do come into play as a generalization. I don't think esport players are overpaid, but I definitely think the publisher can do so much more for these esport organization, all these gaming companies, um, for just covering costs and the in-game revenue portion. And, and if I may bounce back on that also, um, Chris, um, th- th- there is, I mean, at least for the big players, there's something that I, I started to do with some big players. When, when the teams, they can, they cannot pay the salary that we think is deserved by the player. Um, I mean, some teams are more open-minded than others, but I have negotiated salaries that are not up to the level of the player, for example. It should have me more on salary. But to counter that fact, then I succeed to open, like, for example, full sponsorship opportunities. There is no blocking point for the player. I'm talking again about the big players because it doesn't work for the others, but that's mainly the big players that cost a lot of money to the arch, right? If you pay a player, I don't know, 1 million per year, but you block everything, you cannot have sponsors, right? And then suddenly you pay 400K per year, but you say, yeah, you can have your individual sponsors. We do lack in sport and you can even represent our sponsors. Um, as a collective image, right? We can we can make it work, and then the player suddenly it can it can help five million per year instead of one million. But the organization is not paying more. But obviously, you can jeopardize a little bit your sponsorship, right? But it's a balance that you can find that is started to develop in esports, just like it's done in football, for example, or other sports, and that we start to work on with the organization. Because obviously, like if you talk about the true value of tens. How much should you pay if you block all the sponsors with tens? Way too much. You cannot make it work right now in esports. So you can pay him a normal salary, a good salary, and then you open the sponsorship. We can do a final mouse deal. We can generate a lot of millions for tens. He's happy. The organization is happy. We make it work for everyone. That's something that is starting to develop in esports because for five years ago, the, the organizations were like, no, you cannot have, even have individual sponsorship. It doesn't exist for you. And then we started to fight about it and we started to educate the organization that, yeah, but the revenue that we can generate for the player, you don't have to pay him for that. And you don't jeopardize your business by paying 5 million per year. And that's something that is pretty new also. That is something, obviously, that is working for the big players because you don't find an individual sponsor for a 17 years old that don't have any um, fan base yet. But it's something that can work for the big salaries. And something that I see we will... Um, I think we will see it developing more and more for the superstars right now. Awesome. Awesome. Some good stuff. Jake, anything, anything you want to add? No, I think those two are definitely uh, much more better uh, suited to actually answer that question. Uh, it is obviously an ongoing discussion though, outside looking in about maybe some players, I think the community would say, yeah, some players maybe are making too much for the video games they play. But I do think you guys bring great points. So the business models behind those players maybe not being well suited enough. Like the players have that value, they have that worth, but we as an industry haven't found out a way to actually make that seem very uh, doable for, for all players of the caliber. So yeah, I think it's a discussion that could go on for a lot longer between uh, my perspective and obviously where you guys come from. I got a question for you, Jake. Like you've got one of the biggest news platforms in all of gaming and esports, quite clearly. How do players or teams get featured by you? Like what are you looking for? Are you looking for like specific <clears throat> stories? Are you looking for inside info? Like how do, how do people get featured on your platform? Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think news is a definite struggle. You know, I, I, it's tough from, from the news perspective. I, I think news also kind of borderlines content creation and you see content creators are a lot of, like again, the top percent make a, a lot of money when it comes to news, the, the money definitely is is nowhere near that. You know, people people are getting by and covering anything to to make it work. And I'm I'm certainly one of those individuals. It's also sometimes tough when you have high end profiles who are making six to seven figures. You reach out for an interview, you're more than likely to get stonewalled, turned away, or you know, put on put on the back burner for quite some time because they don't need an interview. They don't need any further exposure. Um, you didn't catch them early enough. And unfortunately, I would say on the esports side of things and the interview side of things, unless you're covering a tens or a, a, a Zai Wu, a top, top person in esports, the viewership is, is almost not really worth, as sad as it is to say, the pursuit of those individuals. So 
Um, yeah, I think it's a difficult space to be in. That's why streaming and gaming and content creators and indie devs have now entered the space of what I cover because esports alone is not enough. It's like a question they need to ask themselves, right? Like I'm pitching Jake to cover my story. Like what does it do for him? Like you've got to be conscious of your own views and, and what your own audience wants to read and stuff too. Right. And I'm like, I've been screaming on Twitter and LinkedIn for ages because no PR managers send me shit really, except for Jeremy, you know, I covered the 10 thing and it did really well, but you know, people need to ask the question, like if I'm just sharing this boring ass press release with Chris, like, is he really going to want to share it? Like, cause I've got some new mouse pad sponsor. Like I don't care about that. Like I want, I want to know deeper, like give me some inside info or tell me some numbers or something that you can't normally get. And it's part of the reason why I made this, you know, topic thing. And I, led with those kind of questions at the start. Like, tell me like how, how much exactly do players get paid? What is sticker money? You know, that kind of stuff. Exactly. There's gotta be something different. There's gotta be even just a tinge of information that you, that isn't already public. There isn't just so broad and boring that anything can be announced with that information. So yeah, I, I guess you, you look for stories that even if it's a, a lower tier streamer or a lower tier player, if they have a beautiful come up story, or if there's something very unique about them, that those are the things that uh, you know, you, you try and seek out or hope they seek you out. But yeah, I, I don't think we're at a time where people maybe see the value of news outlets or interviews quite yet. And that's okay. I think that fault lies on both ends, both the players, streamers and creators and the outlets like myself um, for not reaching out in the first place to even try. Sometimes, sometimes you feel defeated and you stop tr trying to make it work. And sometimes you try things over and over again, like interviews, and that it's just not worth the effort. So, um, you know, hoping those kind of things bounce back. Sweet. All right. I think we've been going for long enough. It's been almost two hours. So <laughs> I should probably let Jeremy get to bed and um, everybody else get on with their lives. So um, starting with Ollie, then we go Jeremy, then Jake. If anyone in the audience wants to follow you guys, see what you do, where's the best place to do so? Uh, for me personally, just follow me on Twitter. It's probably where I'm most active at the moment, but even LinkedIn, I'm probably going to start getting a bit more active here just with uh, connection with Chris and then connections with Monster Energy side, who I'm currently working full time with. Um, definitely going to be more active within the esports space on both Twitter and uh, LinkedIn. Yeah, for me, it's the same. It's uh, mainly Twitter, pretty active on Twitter and then trying to be more active on LinkedIn. Um, but yeah, mainly Twitter. If you want to follow the the news about Prodigy, about everything we do, it's mainly on Twitter. And uh, we post the main news on, on LinkedIn also. Yep, same here, guys. I'm a LinkedIn fella now, thanks to Chris. So LinkedIn and Twitter works. <laughs> they got to start paying me some commission, surely. <laughs> For sure, dude. We're about, to, we're about to get someone else onto LinkedIn, aren't we, Jake? The guy you just introduced me to is booking a meeting now. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see some people coming across onto this platform and, you know, fighting against the surge of just, uh, in an Australian term, dog shit content, which plagues this platform. It'll be it'll be cool to see. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. All right. Thanks, uh, thanks to you guys for joining and thanks to everyone who's listening below. Um, tomorrow I'll be announcing next week's topic which will be esports sales sucks and how to fix it. So probably going to be talking about a lot of the stuff that we talked about from the revenue standpoint, but from the other angle. And the two guests that's going to be in there will be Arena Shimes, who's the Chief Revenue Officer of G2 Esports, and then Jeff Pabst, who's at Loaded, um, the world's biggest uh, Western-focused, at least, influencer agency in the gaming space, and he was the Chief Revenue Officer at FaZe. And the reason I chose those two people is combined, they've both sold over $100 million worth of esports and gaming deals. So I think they hopefully know what they're talking about. And uh, Jake will be joining us for that one too. So so thanks everyone. Uh, thanks for putting up with us, just shooting the shit for two hours and hopefully we'll see you in the next one. <laughs> thanks everybody. Legendary. Thank you everyone. Cheers, Thank you everyone. Have a good day. Got gotcha, you fellas. Have a good day. Hey, bye.